Hello and welcome to the Triward Walk online lecture series. I am Michael Fink from the University of Hamburg, working group of Professor Ratter, and I'm also part of the project C4 Society, which is looking into coastal vegetated ecosystems as carbon sinks. So how much CO2 can be stored in these ecosystems, which is also called a blue carbon perspective. And I will look into social perceptions of blue carbon. That means, first of all, I will talk about climate change and the Paris Agreement. Then I will figure out that there is a need for negative emissions, so to take out CO2 of, out of the atmosphere. And then I talk about the potential of blue carbon to store this carbon. And then I will go to social perspectives on these ecosystems and these technologies via a street survey. So in the end, I will have talked about the societal acceptance of coastal vegetated ecosystems as carbon sinks. I will start with a graph that's most difficult to understand, but once understood, it's um, helping to see the severity of climate change and the problems we are facing. So on the x-axis, we see the time and on the other, we see the temperature. So um, 2000 years ago, uh, 20,000 years ago at the peak of the last ice age, from there the temperature increased by something like three degrees to normal temperatures. And um, thereby throughout these 10,000 years, animals like the mammoths got extinct. Today, uh, we are heating up the planet, man-made, and um, so far we are at something like 1.3 degrees, but um, there is no end in sight. And therefore we are, the, and the speed is something like a hundred times faster than um, normal changes in the climate. And therefore, um, in 2015, the world um, community decided that we must stay below two degrees to avoid the most severe uh, problems. And we should do our best to stay at something like 1.5 degrees. And um, within this range, some elements of the climate might already collapse. That means uh, starting with the coral reefs. Um, now we are pretty sure that the coral reefs um, will uh, not survive this century. More than 90% of the coral reefs will be gone, ecosystems as diverse as the Amazon rainforest. And looking into Europe, Germany used to have five glaciers. Since this summer, we only have four left and none of them are likely to see next century. Some Austrian glaciers will probably see next century. And um, this has a lot of implications on our river systems um, on and um, the local environments. And um, coming to the Arctic summer sea ice, um, the North Pole is covered with ice in winter and summer. And um, during summer, this ice is melting and it might be that the Arctic is ice-free in summer. Um, 
that means a white glacier snow area will change into a blue ocean area and um, white reflects sun blue does not reflect the sun that good but takes heat and therefore um, regional and maybe even global uh, warming will um, accelerate and this can have domino effects like on the Greenland ice in case Greenland starts melting the sea level will rise by something like six meters and right now it's unclear whether this process has already started. Um, looking into the southern hemisphere, the West Antarctic ice shield, um, if that starts melting, um, that will mean another five to seven meters of sea level rise. Um, and once such processes start, they are irreversible. That means we can only change the speed of melting, whether we have some uh, few centuries or some more centuries time to adapt to these um, uh, 6 to 12 meters of sea level rise. Coming to the next slide, uh, here we see a reduction pathway that is needed to stay below 1.5 degrees. So um, here we see the, the time and here we see our global emissions and we are still not reaching the peak. We are not reducing our emissions globally, but each year we um, emit more CO2 than the year before and uh, we need to reduce it. And in order to stay below 1.5 degrees, um, we should be somewhere if way before 2050, we should be at zero emissions. Um, and I'm sad to, and if we don't do anything, then we have used up the carbon budget before 2030. This graph, I'm sorry to tell you, is already two years old. So um, we have by now something like five years left. And uh, if we look into history, such information is not new. In 2009, the um, scientific advisory board of the um, Bundesregierung of the uh, German government uh, published this graph saying if we peak in 2011, uh, we don't have to reduce to down to zero at all. But if we are stupid enough to um, continue to um, yeah, um, increase our emissions, then the reduction pathways must be way faster and 9% is um, not manageable. Um, yeah, that was the main message here uh, in 2009, so 13 years ago. And um, yeah, we did not peak in the worst scenario they could imagine at 35 uh, billion uh, megatons, but um, yeah, we are still continuing to grow and have already passed the 40 gigatons um, uh, emissions. So 
um, there is no way anymore to um, stay within Paris and especially to stay below 1.5 degrees with reduction alone. So in, on top of reducing our emissions, we also need to remove emissions. That means taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, not only looking into putting less into the atmosphere, but taking it out again. So here we see pathways how to reduce emissions in gray and brown to go down. And then in these blue, green colors, we say we also need negative emissions. So that means um, on such a pathway, at this point um, here we will peak um, our emissions and then we will reduce it and at the same time we build up negative emission technologies. So we are at net zero somewhere there at that time and then towards the end of the century we are even cooling down the planet maybe to is maybe at that time we have already um, passed uh, the 1.5 degree, maybe we have even passed the 2 degree and then slowly we go back to below 2 degree or maybe even back to something closer to 1.5 degrees. These are the ideas here how to somehow be able to stay within Paris. So what are negative emission technologies and their potentials? Um, there are more nature-based solutions like planting something and more technical solutions mostly called CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage. And here we see the potentials of these um, technologies. Um, right now, as we learned, uh, we emit more than 40 gigatons per year. And these technologies are somewhere between one and five gigatons. So first of all, again, we need to reduce our emissions. But on top of that, we might, we should go for some negative emissions and um, just planting trees um, would um, need an area probably half the size of Europe of just planting trees in addition to every forest that's existing right now on earth to reach some levels of two to three gigatons per year. So these ideas are very limited in total amounts. Um, other ideas are to, um, uh, yeah, to store carbon below ground, more technical solutions. They right now need a lot of energy to work. So um, to get them in a bigger scale um, is own, does only make sense once we are at 100% renewables. Um, and um, I will today talk about um, coastal ecosystems, a more nature-based solution, um, which uh, yeah, has some interesting potentials. So I, if we look from the land towards the sea, um, the tidal zone, there are tidal marshes in German Salzwiesen. Uh, in tropical regions, we have mangroves. I won't go deeper into this. Uh, these are the tidal marshes. I'm more talking about them and seagrass and a little bit on 
macro LG kelp forests as typical blue carbon ecosystems and their potential. So if we look into forests, they can store something like four to five gram of carbon per square meter per year. Blue carbon ecosystems, on the other hand, can store 30 to 50 times more CO2 per square meter per year. So there is a huge potential. Yet, um, if we look into areas, we can only go along the coasts as we need salt water and we need um, light so and um, special um, rock sediment material where it can grow so um, the size is very limited and on top of that um, these ecosystems right now are already under pressure um, people are harvesting mangroves are cutting them down, um, are cutting the other ecosystems um, for some kind of economic development, uh, building harbors, building um, hotels or whatever we want to have along our coasts. And climate change is itself, heat waves are really making these ecosystems already suffer, so we are losing them right now. And thereby, these ecosystems are really great, not just looking into um, them as carbon sinks, but apart from storing carbon, they are biodiversity hotspots, they are spawning grounds for young fish, they filter our water from pollutions and um, they already fight climate change. They uh, slow down ocean currents, wave energy, um, they protect the coasts from erosion and they even raise um, the land uh, as they accumulate sediments and thereby protect us from sea level rise and um, storm surges. And on top of these great uh, contributions, um, they provide food, um, fuel, um, it can be used for recreation, good for our health, good for our economy. Um, yeah, and now I come finally to our uh, North Sea coast where I did a street survey on the social or societal acceptance of such ecosystems. What do German coastal people think about these ecosystems. I had a questionnaire of uh, 50 open and closed question and as a group with other students we made, uh, we interviewed local population and we did some 140 interviews along the German uh, North Sea coast and uh, we tried to capture more um, rural areas as well as more urban areas. Um, the first part was just to talk about um, values, what do people value, what do people fear, and we started with um, what's typical for your 
Heimat for your home region and yeah people um, say yeah it's the sea it's the wind it's the marine environment what's typical for us they also talk about um, some social cultural features naming people and characterizing them sometimes nicely uh, friendly sometimes as something they like stubborn and um, they uh, refer to some sometimes to the economy and infrastructure and uh, another open question was on personal engagement what if people do something for their home region and yeah, uh, most people are engaged, um, uh, socially engaged, that can be um, helping out in a kindergarten or um, helping the elderly, some environmental engagement, cultural engagement, and also some people say, no, I don't do anything. Um, but most people, three quarters do a lot. And um, then we asked what are threats for this region. Here you see a word, word cloud. And um, yeah, um, basically two kinds of threats they mention. The first is tourism and things based on tourism like the housing prices are accelerating and housing development is kind of ugly. Um, so these are threats, but even more important than tourism is things around flooding, Sturmflut, Hochwasser, Überflutung, Deichbruch, um, such are uh, the fears of the people and flooding is directly related to climate change and sea level rise. Um, and uh, in Lower Saxony, people also mention being unemployed and poverty as fears. And now we come to attitudes to nature one more word cloud what is nature for you here people first refer to the forest and animals and they also refer to coastal features like the sea water the beach and uh, they also name the dike so an artificial structure can be uh, incorporated as part of nature but most people see nature as something untouched not influenced where we are alone no humans no cars no buildings and um, closed questions um, here we see um, people had five different uh, answers to choose from yes rather yes rather no no or i don't know and then um should the question was should certain areas be protected from human uses and with such a sentence some 90 percent agree so nature conservation nature protection is a value um, then I asked whether nature conservation is successful. It's a mixed picture. And I asked or gave the statement, my environment is destroyed. And there more people disagree with such a statement than agree. But um, yeah, people are fearing that the nature is about to be destroyed. So then um, the group 
and I looked into um, the specific ecosystems. We talked about the salt marshes, the sea grasses and the macroalgae and we asked two types of questions for these ecosystems. One is whether these ecosystems are worth to be conserved and here um, some 90% agree these ecosystems should be um, conserved. Then I asked whether these ecosystems should be actively expanded and there we see that a lot of people say I just don't know, I can't answer such a question whether these ecosystems should be actively expanded and more than half people say yes or rather yes, these ecosystems should be expanded but we also see um, resistance that people say no we should not actively interfere into these ecosystems especially with the macroalgae people there is a small group who resist against such ideas then um, we started talking about climate change, some closed questions. Is climate change man-made? And there people say, yes, it is. And I asked whether climate change is a threat. And here the people say, yes, it is. And do we do enough against climate change? There people say, no we don't do enough. So there is a lot of potential that we should do more against climate change in this region. And then I asked whether people uh, agree to these statements. Um, the first one is I want to participate in decision making processes. And here half people say yes, half people say no. Um, then I could contribute new ideas in such decision-making processes. Again, half the people say yes and half the people say no. And um, then uh, the last statement was the quality of life will be better in 30 years time. And there people are pessimistic. They say no climate um, no um, quality of life will not be better in 30 years time. Uh, we did some correlations and surprisingly answers on whether climate change is man-made and a threat have no uh, significant connection to this answer. Um, so that means whether the quality of life will be better or worse in 30 years is not um, from a climate answered from a climate change perspective. So um, coming to an end, we wrap up that we learned today that climate change is a serious threat and negative emissions are needed to stay within the range of Paris. Um, then we learned that coastal vegetated ecosystems can store CO2 very effectively. Um, so therefore they can be an important role regarding carbon dioxide removal but in total numbers it will still be small because of limited sizes, limited areas. And um, we should always keep in mind that these coastal vegetated ecosystems have a lot of co-benefits, um, benefits apart from binding CO2. And um, the people along the North Sea coast 
they appreciate these ecosystems and they are in favor of nature conservation, thereby nature is often idealized as being untouched. So therefore, if we want to do some active intervention in these ecosystems, then um, yeah, we need to include the local population um, to avoid resistance. And a last um, um, climate change is a familiar term for the people and perceived as a serious threat. Yet people are not familiar with negative emission strategies um, and uh, therefore um, knowledge is limited. So um, yet um, there is a motivation. Half of the people say they would engage in processes to implement change to develop their region. And therefore in a conclusion, participation and knowledge exchange are key to win local people over blue carbon strategies. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention.